As we embark on this odyssey that spans thousands of years, the chronicles of aviation designs and materials unfolds with the delicate grace of ancient Chinese kites before the dawn of Christ. This historical journey weaves through the epics, tracing the metamorphosis from aerostatic to aerodynamic flight and from rudimentary truss design where wood served as the backbone, covered in linen or canvas, to the innovative adoption of monocoque structures fashioned from timber. Subsequently, the aviation narrative embraces the advent of semi-monocoque constructions crafted from robust aluminum alloys. Each stage in this progression illustrates the persistent human quest for flight, marked by the evolution from traditional designs to contemporary marvels chasing a quest of ever faster speeds, higher altitudes, and less fuel consumption. Amidst this narrative, the pivotal transition toward advanced composite materials and exotic metals stands as a testament to the relentless pursuit of excellence and efficiency as aviation surges into the future, propelled by a symphony of innovation, resilience, and material science mastery. Man has always looked to the sky and dreamed of flying from ancient times. We don't know who, but someone at some point started studying this natural marvel we call flying. The ideas came from watching the flight of birds such as seagulls and albatross being stationary without flapping wings and yet glide and soar in the air. Long before the time of Christ, kites were invented and flown by the Chinese to emulate this very method of flying. They were simple in design and were made of bamboo and silk, then bamboo and paper. The design was genius and efficient. It was sticks in crisscross fashion that connected at its corners a shape of silk or paper that often resembled a bird or a person. A set of strings was tethered from the kite to the flyer. By the pulling of certain strings, the kite could be maneuvered in the air. Though man has dreamed of flying for a very long time, it will be another 2,000 years or so through an imagination, visionary design, and engineering before man will come up with some sensible ideas that pertain to flying. Now, how are we going to do this? was the question that man has been asking himself for thousands of years. Today, kites are still flowing across the four corners of the world, mainly used for recreation, inspiring the youth, and exciting the seasoned flyers. The designs and materials used are more cutting edge nowadays than they were back then. And they're made of very light synthetic materials, such as ripstop nylon, Plastic film, carbon fiber is used for rods and frames. Synthetic rope and cords such as nylon, polyethylene, and Kevlar are used as brittle and kite line. And believe it or not, these are some of the very same materials used in aviation today. After millennia of exploration and innovation, humanity had at last, conceived sensible ideas that would pave the way toward the achievement of human flight. Leonardo da Vinci, a visionary who dared to dream of flying machines, was also inspired by watching the flight of birds. For many years, almost nothing that was created by Leonardo survived, other than some paintings, which, by the way, they're very famous today. Much of what was written was kept in private hands for several centuries. But in the 1800s, his written works came to light only to find out he had other interests besides painting that also involved the study of flight. He wrote about 35,000 words and produced some 500 sketches focusing exclusively on flying machines, nature of air, and the flight of birds. Between 1505 and 1506, during a painting of the Mona Lisa, he produced what has come to be known as the Codice sul volo degli uccelli, or the Codex on the Flight of Birds. His writings and sketches focus mainly on ornithopters, or the flapping of a wing design, but also understood that men could never match the strength and endurance 
of birds. The codex demonstrated a rudimentary understanding of stall and the importance of a curvature, or we call today camber, in a wing to create lift, and a crucial relationship between a center of gravity and a center of lift on a bird's wing. He also makes insightful observations on the gliding of birds and their ability to stabilize in flight by the maneuvering of wings and tail just as the Wright brothers would eventually do during the development of their aeronautical designs. Leonardo's drawings were rather sophisticated and detailed for his time. One of his flying machines, wingspan exceeded 33 feet. It was made of pine wood covered in raw silk to create a light and sturdy membrane. The pilot would lie face down in the center of the flying device on a board much like the gliders do today, even though they don't necessarily lie down on a board. He also had drawings or created drawings of a vertical takeoff and landing flying screw made of wood and silk, but as far as we know, none of his creations actually flew. It took another 260 years before man could separate himself from the world and it was achieved by the Montgolfier brothers' uncontrolled ascent. In 1783, two of 16 children of Pierre Montgolfier, who owned a paper factory, were going about their life doing what young men do. The idea came from observing a woman's skirts billowing from hot air while being dried by burning the charcoal. The idea spurred several designs and experiments were conducted that grew eventually in size until a final prototype was made. The final creation was made of cotton canvas with paper glued inside and out with a wood base frame. It weighed about 800 pounds. The fuel used to heat the air was chopped wool, straw, and dried horse manure. There was no means to steer or navigate the balloon, but on September 19, 1783, up and went, and the first ever flight lasted 15 minutes, lifting a sheep, duck, and a rooster to a height of about 1,800 feet. After that first flight, the brothers conducted several other flights where people were carried. As always, man likes to improve what he has seen and learned, and in 1852, Henry Giffard created the first dirigible. The machine was held in suspense with hydrogen inside a cigar-shaped balloon. The balloon was made of cotton fiber impregnated with rubber. The frame was made of wood and ropes enveloped the balloon. It had a rudimentary rudder system and it was powered by a 350 pound steam engine producing three horsepower spinning the propeller at about 110 revolutions per minute or RPM. The highlight of the dirigibles was during the development of the Zeppelin-style dirigibles by German inventor Ferdinand von Zeppelin, who took cues from past inventors. We started formulating notions of a dirigible in 1874 and began development in 1893. The final and most advanced design had an aluminum alloy frame, which we'll get into later why it was an aluminum alloy, and hydrogen-filled bags. The balloon was covered in a tough canvas cloth. It was powered by gasoline piston engines, spinning propellers, and had the yaw and pitch control surfaces for elevation and directional controls. Nevertheless, many dirigibles had already crashed, causing fatalities due to the dangers associated with the use of hydrogen. The helium was available in the US, America did not sell it to anyone, forcing the Germans to use hydrogen. The Hindenburg crash of May 6, 1937 was the final nail in the coffin for the dirigibles in its extensive use. To this day, it is still the largest man-made flying machine. Today, we still use frameless dirigibles called blimps, but more for advertisement, scouting whales, and covering sporting events. The current blimps are made of polyester coated with Tedlar and filled with helium, which is, by the way is very expensive to fill. Flight decks are made of aluminum alloys and are powered by piston engines driven propellers.
While lighter than air was being developed to bigger shapes, carrying more payload and going farther, faster, even around the world, experiments with aerodynamic flight were taking place through Sir George Cayley from England, Otto Lilienthal from Germany, Clement Adair from France, and Dr. Samuel Langley of the United States at around the same time. In 1804, Sir George Cayley was the first to design and build a glider and discovered the four aerodynamic forces of flight, which we know today as weight, thrust, lift, and drag. He was instrumental in the understanding for a need to curve or camber the airfoil to create lift, much like Da Vinci had already intimated. Though the machine was made of wood and canvas, it managed to fly, albeit for a short while. The problem at the time was a light enough proportional method that would not be created until much later. It had a rudimentary flight control system that resembled a rudder on a small boat and wheels for landing gears. Between 1891 and 1896, Otto Lilienthal, on the other hand, made thousands of man-powered glider flights that would eventually kill him. He developed eight different designs that all revolved around the hand glider, the gliders were made of split willow frames covered with cotton twill fabric sealed with collodion to make the fabric airtight. In 1890, Clement Adair also managed to fly. The design was a bat-looking aircraft. The aircraft had no directional flight controls. The frame was made of wood covered in linen and it had the wheels for landing gear. It was powered by two vertical steam engines combined producing 24 horsepower, rotating two propellers. Clement managed to get airborne for about 100 yards until a gust of wind veered him off the low altitude fly path. In 1896, Dr. Samuel Langley developed a glider powered by a steam engine. It had a tandem wing with a rear fixed empennage. It was launched from a houseboat with a catapult to save weight, did not have any flight controls, and the wings and tail were made of wood and silk while the center structure was made of steel tubing, which housed the copper boiler that spun to simple propellers. One of the flights traveled about a thousand yards or a thousand meters and supposedly was his most successful of flight. In the end, it was Wilbur and Oroville Wright who managed to gather all the information and knowledge of their predecessors and come up with a design that could eventually fly and remain in flight. A true flying machine capable of maneuvering along the three axes of rotation we have come to know today as roll, pitch, and yaw. In 1899, Wilbur designed a flight control system and built a kite out of wood and cotton it was held together with wire and a box-like structure to test the flight system. From 1900 to 1902, they built gliders to refine and test their flight control system hundreds of times at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. Back at home in Dayton, Ohio, they built a wind tunnel to refine the shape of their wing and airfoil that was about the size of, let's say, a 55-gallon drum. and was very simple in its construction. In 1903, with the help of Charles Taylor, machinist skills, and the two brothers of bicycle ingenuity, they developed a four-cylinder engine with an aluminum crankcase producing 12 horsepower weighing about 170 pounds. The engine drove two bicycle chains rotating two 8.5 foot diameter propellers rotating at 330 RPM and combined to produce about 90 pounds of thrust and it was enough to power the 750 pound plane to sustain flight. And mind you, the 750 pound weight also include the weight of the pilot. The flying machine had a biplane wing design made of wood, consisted of trusses and wing spars with ribs held together with wire. The wing was covered with cotton canvas and the wing twisted to achieve roll and had a movable rudder and pitch mechanism. On a fateful day of December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers solved the problem of flying, and in a short while, designs and new technologies launched the era of aviation forward at fantastic speeds.
Once the Wright brothers understood the nature of flying, it was only a matter of time before people started copying their idea. All sorts of airplane designs sprung up overnight, emulating more or less the Wright brothers in concept. In 1909, Louis Blériot and his Type 11 plane created a winning model to stabilize flight and set the stage for how planes will look for decades to come. It had a monoplane wing design which frame twisted for roll control. The engine was mounted in front of the wing powering a fixed pitch prop whereas the yaw and pitch controls were mounted in the far rear of the center of lift allowing for smaller control surfaces and reduced drag. The wing profile was covered in linen. It was made with formers and stringers of oak and poplar as far as the fuselage goes and it also had a landing gear system. Not only did this plane fly, it was the first airplane to cross the English Channel. With the increase in speeds, it came thicker and bigger wood structure but it also had its limitations. Although wood was wildly popular, it required skilled labor for the working and shaping of the wood structure, which made airplanes expensive uh, to build. Woodworking also did not lend itself to manufacturing automation. Also finding trees with grains suitable for aircraft construction was actually hard. Laminated wood had to be created with grains aligned in the same direction to carry the stress loads associated uh, with flying. Wood and cotton were fine so long as airplanes did not exceed speeds of 160 miles an hour. But you will say, well, why is that the case? Because it was difficult to streamline a wing and fuselage with just trusses and spars covered in canvas. That's the reason why. With engines becoming ever more powerful, it became apparent that the next logical step would be to improve stiffness and strength with new designs and materials that would not only sustain the stress loads of flying but also allowed more space and more payload. Manufacturers started doing away with wood and developing welded metal tubular structure called girders to carry the loads associated with higher speeds. The design was only good for limited space allowance, however, but proved robust and a good substitute uh, for wood. The structures were strong, but it had the disadvantage of needing additional fabrication around the metal frame to streamline the airplane. The extra weight was necessary to reduce drag, improve aerodynamics, and appearance. This conservative mentality and reliability of structural strength was still present in 1935 with the Hawker Hurricane. The new load-bearing methods and designs were already in existence. Even though the monocoque design was first made in 1911, when Swiss marine engineer Eugene Ruchonnet built the cigar, the monocoque idea did not gain traction until nine years later. Between 1918 and 1920, Jack Northrup developed and built for Lockheed an advanced monocoque design that was cutting edge for its time. It was a hollow tube consisting of bulkheads and formers that had a plywood skin which carried all the stress loads associated with flying. Prime examples of such designs were the Vega 5B with the top wing and the Cyrus with the lower wing design, both built by Lockheed. The design was much more spacious which allowed for more cargo and passengers. There were two main disadvantages, however, with the wood monocoque design. It required extensive amount of skilled labor, which drove cost up and did not lend itself to mass production. If damaged occurred on the skin, the structure would lose its rigidity. Imagine poking a can of soda. That's essentially how a monocoque design was made. This weakness fostered the idea of the semi-monocoque design by introducing more formless and adding stringers to stiffen the skin and help carry uh, the load. Wood fuselages and wings were proven to become too expensive to build and a solution was needed to cut cost and improve manufacturing. The next logical choice of material was aluminum, being the best candidate for construction of airplanes because of its weight or metal. 
but did not become a reliable material for manufacturing until the invention of Duralumin by German metallurgist Alfred Wilm in 1906, which he then patented in 1909. It was an alloy that combined aluminum with copper, manganese, and magnesium in small amounts. This alloying process increased the strength and characteristics without increasing the weight of the metal. It was also widely used during the construction of the Zeppelin dirigibles. When the patent was developed for Duralumin, uh, the patent was not sold to everyone and anyone, and as a matter of fact, the United States was not privy, nor did it have access to the patent for Duralumin. Remember the story with the helium, how the United States did not sell any helium to the Germans. So what did the United States do? The United States pumped huge sums of money into Alcoa, a metallurgic company of back then, to develop the alloy for military use. After much research and development, and I wouldn't doubt if there was some espionage involved as well, the alloy became available in the United States after 13 years in 1922 under the trademark by Alcoa of 17S. Today, aluminum is alloyed under various designations when mixed with any of these metals such as copper, manganese, silicone, magnesium, magnesium and silicone, and zinc. The alloy finally allowed for cheaper manufacturing and mass production and became the perfect solution for an expensive problem that lowered manufacturing costs and made for better quality and consistent product. But the downside of this thing, the alloy is subject to corrosion, which we'll address later in this video. As airplanes became bigger, improvements in the design from a semi-monocoque to a reinforced semi-monocoque helped with the load bearing on the airplane's skin. This reduced stress concentrations and improved structural fatigue life. The use of longer owns, formers, and stringers to reinforce the skin structure came closer together, and wings were also made of a box structure with spars, ribs, and stringers and allowed for the carrying of fuel in the wings. With further improvement in engine performance and increased speeds, wings became thinner to reduce drag. Jet engines allowed for airplanes to go even faster and higher, which spurred the need for pressurized cabins. The pressurization cycle, however, created new problems for the stressed skin design, which became the Achilles heel of the de Havilland Comet. To mitigate the problem of cracks developing in high-stress areas of the fuselage, thicker skin, smoother edges, round windows, and curves around doors became a new adaptation in aircraft design. Also improvements in heat treatments of the alloy and chemical process such as anodizing and alclad covering mitigated the corrosion issues for the most part that came with the alloying of the aluminum. While aluminum was growing in popularity in and out of aviation, the 60s brought a new era of materials being developed with the introduction of composites and the use of titanium. The SR-71 project saw the study and extensive use of titanium as a light and suitable metal for aircraft construction capable of withstanding the high temperatures generated by friction associated with extreme speeds in excess of Mach 3 and altitudes above 80,000 feet. Although the metal was light and excellent for high temperature uses, it was difficult to work with. It was very expensive not only to acquire but also to produce, and it was actually very hard to come by. Because of its thermal characteristics, however, it is still used today in the aviation world, but mainly used in hot section areas for heat shields. Commercial aviation airplanes, on the other hand, were getting bigger and heavier and new solutions and materials were needed to save on weight. Drawing from wood and its grainy nature, new materials with innovative designs were being developed for special uses that emulated wood patterns. Military has largely been responsible for the research and development of exotic metals, composite materials, resins, 
and structural design since the cost was not a factor considering it's always been a taxpayer's to pick up the tab anyway. Large airplane manufacturers also have contributed in the development of composites because of its lightweight, strength, and stiffness. Because of composites, every pound lost in weight is a pound gained in payload and reduced fuel consumption. Structures can now be made stronger, lighter, and more rigid and less costly than aluminum. They're also better able to withstand the sonic vibrations that are commonly associated with airplane structures which induce metal fatigue and structural uh, failures. Not only the material, but the designs also improved and changed. The use of honeycomb sandwich design, a box structure in itself, made for a stronger and lighter alternative to aluminum, supplanting many of the components such as access panels, floorboards, flight control surfaces, and other applications. One of the first composite materials used in aviation was a thermal setting phenol formaldehyde resin it was reinforced with paper or linen cloth. The phenolic material was called micarta. The product was pioneered in the 30s and is still used today in cable pulleys and electrical insulators. Glass fiber woven into cloth and packed into loose mat and roving have been soaked in polyester resins and shaped with molds into components such as radomes, wing tip caps, and wheel pants since the 1950s. Glass being among the first composite materials is thought of being the ancestor of modern composite structural materials. Modern composites, also known as advanced composite materials, use materials such as graphite fiber, which we know today as carbon fiber, woven into cloth. It is excellent for compression and tensile applications such as flight control surfaces. It is also used extensively in construction of military aircraft and also used uh, in commercial and private sector of aviation today as well. Boron fiber was the first ACM or advanced composite material introduced in the 60s, mainly used in military applications because of its high cost of production. Some of the bombers used in the military had primary structural elements made of boron fiber. But the nice thing about boron fiber, it can also be used for repairs of aircraft cracked aluminum skins. The thermal expansion of boron it is similar to aluminum, that's why. And the nice thing about it is that it does not induce galvanic corrosion. Another ACM is aramid fiber developed by DuPont, which we know as Kevlar. Excellent for tensile stress applications such as protective shields inside engine cowlings, to help catch errant fan blades, used extensively in military aircraft construction, much like graphite, and it is also used for cabin floorboard and access panels in commercial and private sector of aviation. Ceramic fiber, on the other hand, is used for very high temperature applications. It's mainly used in hot section areas of the engines. When it is coated with Teflon, it's used for sewing threads to make high temperature insulation shapes for airplanes and space vehicles. Composite structures are still evolving and new techniques are being developed all the time. For example, we also introduced copper wire mesh into the fiber to induce conductivity for static discharge and electric grounding. With the discovery of aluminum, it became apparent that it was only a matter of time before we would do away with wood and cloth designs pioneered by the likes of Cayley, Lilienthal, Adair, and the Wright brothers. Today, it seems the use of aluminum on aircrafts is slowly reaching the same faith wood and cloth reached with our ancestors for their aircraft construction. Since the 1960s, economic and legislative forces, besides the space race and environmental friendly solutions, have created great incentives in pushing aviation technologies toward more advanced designs and materials. The first aircraft that was made of a composite design was the Havilland Mosquito. Though the airplane was built in the 40s and made of wood, its sandwich construction of plywood with balsa wood core proved to be a remarkable design and formidable in rigidity and strength. The reason for the wood construction was because aluminum was a strategic metal during wartime and supply was often limited. 
The sandwich construction was so novel of an idea that it set a precedent and a benchmark for how composite construction is done today. Since the Havilland Mosquito, huge leaps in science in the field of chemistry has made advanced composite material fibers, its matrices, and designs an ideal choice for the aviation industry. I mean, after all, composites were made uh, for aviation. For example, when the B-1 Lancer was designed in the 60s, it used for its primary structural elements the boron composite fiber. Though the airplane was introduced in the 80s, it is still in service today, and it is a testament of the ACM's abilities. Also, in the 1970, the F-14 Tomcat made use of boron composite for its construction of the horizontal stabilizer. More recently, the B-2 Spirit and F-117 Nighthawk made extensive use of composite materials for their laminate and sandwich construction in their design. Today, most military aircrafts have large amounts of composites and exotic metals integrated in their construction, such as the F-22 Raptor and the F-35 Lightning, to name a couple of the aircraft in the arsenal of the military. In the commercial world, as of lately, both Boeing with their 787 and Airbus with their A350XWB have more than 50% of their structures made of composite materials. The beauty of the composites is that they are better suited for stress fatigue inducing vibrations that lead to cracks. They are stiffer and stronger. They're also chemical resistant, corrosion resistant, and they're lightweight. I mean, you can't beat them and you cannot deny the abilities of these composite materials. In the business and personal jet world, the progress is just as remarkable. Beechcraft Starship was one of the first almost all composite material aircraft with fuselage made almost entirely of advanced composite materials using very minimal metal in its construction. The Cessna Citation Mustang, under the designation of Very Light Jet, is made almost entirely of advanced composite materials as well. The SO, with their newer Falcon aircraft, already makes extensive use of uh, advanced composites uh, on their horizontal stabilizer, ailerons, access panels, floorboards, furniture frames, internal ducts, and flight control rods, to name a few of the components that the SO uses on their more modern airplanes. In their up and coming Falcon 10 X, the wing will also be made almost entirely of advanced composite materials, according uh, to the so. In this captivating journey through aviation evolution, from ancient Chinese kites to contemporary composite marvels, each epic resonates with the audacity of human ambition. Da Vinci sketches, the Mongol Fear Brothers balloons and the Wright Brothers' historic flight form a lineage of determination and innovation. The shift from trust to advanced composite materials symbolizes a transformative era in aviation where each technological leap propels us closer to the limitless skies. Beyond the alloyed wings and carbon fibers, the narrative is a testament to our unwavering spirit where pioneers dreamed of flight and engineers turn the dreams into realities. As the final chapter unfolds, the composite wings of modern aircraft embody the legacy of those who dared to reach for the clouds. In this intricate dance with the heavens, we, as creators, emulate the very nature of our creator, echoing the divine spark that fuels our boundless quest for exploration and innovation. This tale of evolution isn't confined to materials or structures. It's a testament to the indomitable human spirit, forever poised to explore new frontiers still ahead of us. And with that, we conclude this journey of the designs and material evolution of aviation that brought us to where we are today. I hope you enjoyed this documentary as much as I did making it, and that we will see you next time. Take care.